Okay. <laughs> Hello, hello. Ah, there's Aoife. <laughs> so much waiting to do. <laughs> hello, hello. So exciting. <sighs> Tell me how you're feeling. Give me, give me an emoji on how you're feeling today. Oh no, it is Friday, yes. Are we feeling sick? Oh, hello, Jen, hello. Are we excited? <laughs> hey, stressed? Oh, okay, man, sorry about that. It's Friday though. <laughs> I hope you can just have some fun on this. Oh, pumped. Hope you can just have some fun on this IG Live. So there's that. Um, but yeah, I guess we're just chilling for now. Um, I don't want to give anything away. So we'll just wait a couple more minutes, see who comes on. Where is everybody calling from? Ah, Zina, Zina. <laughs> I can see why now we have music at the beginning because it's kind of like, uh, <laughs> but it's okay. <laughs> Sanchez Street. I don't want a username. Oop. Mediocre human being. I'm sure you're much better than mediocre. <laughs> oh, hey, Elizabeth. <laughs> Thanks for coming. All right, I think we'll start at 4.05, so another few minutes. Um, but yeah. It's not too late to pay music. I don't... How do I... <laughs> It's okay. I think I'm... It's okay. Thank you, though. We'll start in a minute. It's definitely a different feel than having Aoife here, too, because I really <laughs> just feel like I'm talking to myself, but I don't know. It's, it's not the worst of things. Um, so, yeah. Uh, my day was good. Thank you, Jen. I hope your day was also good. Just getting, just finishing set up here. Oh, oh, oh. All right, I think we're ready now. Hello, hello. Cannot wait to learn about consent. <laughs> I cannot wait to talk about it, Jennifer. <laughs> so we're we're in a good place. Um, but yeah, okay. So I guess we can go ahead and get started then. Um, so just a little about a bit about me. Uh, my name is Grace Kwok, and I'm one of the interns at About Face this summer. Oh wait, I got a question from Zena. 
Um, my favorite skill that I've picked up while in quarantine, I don't know if I've picked up any new skills, but I've been running a lot more. Um, so just like going out to trails, trail running, I guess. That's kind of its own thing. But yeah, so I'm Grace. I'm an intern at About Face this summer. Um, my pronouns are she, her, hers. I'm calling from San Jose, California. Um, and very exciting. In the fall, I'll be going down to UCLA to study electrical engineering. Cool. So again, I'm super excited that you're here today. Thank you for coming. Um, and then I especially want to welcome teen girls, um, girls with an asterisk. So um, self-identified and non-binary. And of course, we're, we're here to learn about consent and sex ed um, as a whole. So Hope you're, hope you're interested and excited to learn about that as much as I am. Um, and parents and older adults, I also want to welcome you. Um, oh, thank you for the hearts. <laughs> parents and older adults, I also want to welcome you because there's definitely still things that you can take out of this, especially when trying to talk about this kind of thing to your kids. Um, but then for girls in middle school and below, this may not be for you because it's a little like... Um, I don't know, like, sex is something that takes a lot of adult decision-making skills and your bodies are still developing. Um, but yeah. So, and then, now starting to get into, th to get into things. Um, the reason I'm gearing this toward teen girls is that... Oh, we're gonna, we're gonna show this now. Um, oh, there it is! Oh, it cuts off a little bit. Okay, but um, I have this graph that shows... Um, so the title, which you can't really read, um, it's sex is a natural part of life for most people, including adolescents. Um, so the point of this graph is just to show that, like, teens are having sex by age 18, 65% of people have had, um, sexual intercourse. And I have two big disclaimers on this. One is that it's a little, or it is heteronormative because intercourse is not something that um, people of all sexualities partake in. Um, and so, oh, I got a heart. <laughs> Thank you. Um, but it, this graph does is still telling. So, like, teens are engaging in sex. Now, with the disclaimer that I'm not encouraging anyone to have sex or not have sex, asexual people, I see you. Um, I'm just saying that people deserve to have an education about this kind of thing. Um, and although many parents do worry that um, teaching sex ed and just talking about sex increases the likelihood um, of teens to become sexually active, it's actually, actually the opposite is true. Um, so it actually increases the likelihood, sorry, decreases the likelihood that they'll engage in sex, increases the likelihood that they'll use contraception, and it helps decrease sexual violence. Yeah, sexual intercourse is hetero. Thank you for that, Jen. Man, the lag in comments is kind of, kind of big, but that's okay. Hello, Black Magic. But yeah. Um, and anyway, 65% um, of teens who have engaged in sex means that 35% have not. Um, and 35% is still a big percentage, so, yeah. And also, <laughs> sometimes it seems like the media it tries to, or sometimes it seems like the media portrays teen, like, portrays that 100% of teens are having sex, which is not at all true. But yeah. Any thoughts so far? You can leave a comment. Okay, I'm gonna drink some water. <laughs> Coolio. So, yeah, statistically, um, a comprehensive sex education is something that... Oop, let me get my thing together. Okay. Comprehensive sex ed, something that we need. Um, and not only talking about like condoms and STI prevention, 
um, but also talking about consent and like the emotional side of sex too. So like, how do you know if you're ready? How do you know um, what feels good to you and your partner? And how do you communicate in a way that feels comfortable for you? Um, so yeah, there's, there's a lot that is good to know, I guess. And um, one thing that amazes a lot of people, oh, I got another heart, thank you. <laughs> is here's a quiz for you so leave a comment um guess how many states in the u.s require sex ed program content to be medically accurate leave a number in the comments all right while i wait for the comments to come in i have some fun fa oh 15 okay okay um, another fun fact is that Mississippi banned the use of condoms for in-person demonstrations. Oh, five? Okay. <laughs> Low expectations for our public school system. <laughs> Ten? Okay. Twenty-five? Okay. Yeah, um, so the answer is seventeen. And that's kind- not enough- <laughs> not enough, yeah. <laughs> that's right, Elizabeth. Um, 40 was, was a very, have it has, that's a very nice view of the education system. Um, but yeah, not enough. Medically accurate is honestly a, a pretty low bar. Um, so yeah, if kids can't learn how to have safe sex and, um, like, feel okay at, like, exploring their, how they are as a sexual being, if you can't learn that from school, then maybe you can learn that from parents? Well, <laughs> I have this awkward photo just kind of to show the awkwardness, um, but statistics say half of all teens feel uncomfortable about talking um, about, to their parents about sex, and 57% of parents feel somewhat uncomfortable talking about it with their teens. Um, and although the ideal would be if uh, parents and teens didn't feel uncomfortable with each other. It kind of is. <laughs> um, or, that's kind of the reality. So, yeah. Now we're like, so where do we get our info? So, we, if we can't get it from the school system because it can't be trusted, and we can't get it from our parents because it's just awkward, <laughs> where do we get our information? Uh... My slides are out of order. Okay. Well, okay, we get it from the media. We just Google it like we do everything else. Uh, <laughs> um, but yeah, so there was a study that showed that two-thirds of young people turn to the media when they want to learn about sex, which is why media literacy really is closely tied to sex education. Um, it said, the study says that they actively sought out sexual content in media as a means of learning the rules, skills, and rituals of romance and relationships. Um, and honestly, like, you don't even really have to actively seek it out because it's really easy to access and it's almost, like, inescapable. So, like, sex is in the media a lot. Like, this ad, you can't quite see the top, but, um, the top of that American Apparel ad says, like, it says, school's out. <laughs> it's just, like, it's just, like, really sexual, even though, like, they're just talking about school being out. Um, and then those magazines on the bottom are also, um, like, two of the headlines. There's, what does it say, your sexiest body and make good sex great. Um, so sex is in the media a lot. Um, and kids are looking to it for, um, their sex education. Any thoughts? You can leave a comment below. Um, and yeah. So, more statistics on why this is a problem. So, only 10% of programs include safer sex messages. Um, and... On TV, sexual messages are almost universally portrayed in a positive light, um, so not talking about potential adverse consequences um, or talking about, like, the risks of unprotected um, sex. Jen Tseng, their CEO, was so nasty. <laughs> 
I believe that. <laughs> they have, American Apparel seem to have a lot of, like, just really, <laughs> uh, like, unnecessarily sexual ads for things that didn't relate to sex at all. Um, but yeah, so... And then the other thing about the media controlling our sex education is that the media impacts what we think of as normal. Um, so it encourages people to think of things... Oh, is it better now, Jen? Okay, awesome. Um, the media encourages people to, like, to accept kind of, like, the dominant view of sex in mainstream media and shame people who don't conform to that very, like, one specific image of, um, well, you kind of know the story, like, heterosexual, um, and, like, one kind of, there's gender roles in mainstream, in the sex in mainstream media, um, which we'll get, which we'll get into more later, um, but yeah. Leave a tart or something? <laughs> it really does feel like I'm just talking to myself. Um, that's okay. Um, yeah, and so one example of the media impacting what we think of as normal. Um, so a lot of women believe that if they don't climax before or at the same time as their partner, then something's wrong with them. Um, but that sets unrealistic assumptions because that's not what actually happens in, um, in real life. Most women, like, it takes most women longer to orgasm than men. Um, thank you, Jed. <laughs> I appreciate the, the support. Um, and so, yeah, like, if you think that the media is always right, then you'll feel kind of bad about yourself. But what's really true is that the media perpetuates one image that not everyone can or should want to, um, want to follow. That's a big, like, uh, it's a big concept in media literacy, so. Yeah. Cool, so. <laughs> Um, where are we now on our search for a comprehensive sex ed? So, to recap, schools, no good. Parents, no good, though I'm sure they try. <laughs> and media, not good. <laughs> Thank you for the hearts, I appreciate it. Media, not good, um, because it perpetuates stereotypes, um, and not true. Yeah. So lucky for you. <laughs> um, I, well, so I also didn't have a comprehensive sex ed. Um, I had, like, they had Planned Parenthood come in and kind of talk to us, but it wasn't super in-depth, I guess, and my parents, like, I didn't get the talk at all. Um, but I don't know, I felt like this was something important to know, so I happened upon this book called Girls and Sex by Peggy Orenstein, and that kind of jump-started me into wanting to learn more and more about this topic. Because, um, like, it's a weird... I feel like sex ed and sex in general, I guess, is weirdly taboo, but at the same time glorified in our society. Um, which, and you might get a sense more about what I mean with that later, but... Yeah, it's it's fascinating to me, so... Um, and I've learned a lot about it, and I'm excited to share it with you. So, yeah. Um, but a couple disclaimers before then. Um, so, just the big caveat that I'm not encouraging you to have sex or not have sex. You just deserve to have an education. Um, because knowledge is power. So, power to the people. Um, the other big note is that I'm not someone who has formally studied sex. I don't have a degree in human sexuality, um, and only you or your doctor know what's best for you. Um, but I do want to say that I didn't make up any of this information. I'm just presenting it to you. So, like, I've, I'm putting it in a, a more, like, easy-to-digest form. Um, another disclaimer, 
there won't be any explicit images here. Like, this is probably the most explicit that there is, and you'd find those ads in um, magazines in, like, a grocery store <laughs> or, or at the mall. Um, another big point is all the resources I'll mention will be on a doc that I'll share at the end of this IG Live, so you all can look back on them if you want to learn more. Um, and then the final thing before I start before I get started is definitely please ask me questions. I'll try my best to answer them. Um, and if I don't know the answer to them, I'll definitely point you to a resource that will have the answer. Um, that's another thing that I want to um, stress, I guess, like, someone always has the answer. So, Joy! <laughs> Joy always has the answer. <laughs> um, just kidding. <laughs> Oh, hello, Daliana. Welcome. We have so many friends now. Okay, so yeah, we can finally dive in. Our topic today is consent. Or like how I, or what I like to say, um, where am I? That is not what I like to say. Let me get myself caught up. Yes, okay. Um, what do I like? To oh, yes, that's what I like to say. Consent and non-consent. Because I feel like if you just say consent, then you feel like the absence of consent is, like, nothing. But the absence of consent is non-consent. So, like, if you're not sure about something, it's a no. We'll get into that later. <laughs> but yeah, okay, so to start off, with our conversation. Hello, Joy. Thank you for saying hello to me. Um, <laughs> to start off on our conversation about how consent is portrayed in the media and how we should do, do the consent thing in real life, um, I want to start off with a some media examples. So the first one I have is something that we probably all grew up with and probably loved when we were small and very impressionable. So like our values were just starting to get molded by and shaped by the media. So that is uh, Snow White and Aurora. Oh, hello, Waiter Tizzy. So <laughs> I feel like Disney is one of those things that's almost universally, universally loved. Um, which is kind of scary because now looking at looking at these movies through the lens of consent and non-consent, it's pretty clear <laughs> that the princes did not con get consent from the princesses. Um, because pretty obviously someone who's asleep can't give consent. Um, and yeah, so like message your thought or comment down your thoughts if you... Um, or like, I don't know, like, how do you feel about this? Or maybe how you felt about it when you were a kid versus how you feel about it now. Um, my thought is definitely that it's a little scary that the non-consent here um, was framed as romantic, right? Because, like, even though the the girl didn't want, or even though the girl never consented, it's still, like, like a nice moment, <laughs> I guess. Hello. Thank you, Jen. <laughs> um, it's sad. Yes, it is sad. Um, and I also want to point out, or you can keep commenting your reactions below, um, but I also want to ask you, to guess what year these movies came out for the first time. So, I read your mind. Yes. Awesome. <laughs> but yeah, guess what year Snow White came out for the first time, and guess what year Sleeping Beauty came out for the first time. And I mean the Disney movie. I know they've been like fairy tales for like centuries, but if you guess the year, or if like, when I found out the year that these came out, I was very surprised. And in thinking about the implications of that, it's a little crazy. Do 
2002? Okay. 2000? Any other guesses? Helen, hello! All right, well, <laughs> Snow White came out in 1938 and Sleeping Beauty <laughs> came out in 1959, so yeah, 90s was a good guess. Um, like, what this made me think of, at least, was that we've per we've perpetuated traditional gender roles that have been here since the beginning of the 19th, of the, that's the 20th century. Um, like, we've been showing these, we've been showing these movies to our kids for generations. Um, and it's kind of trippy to think about that because we think that like so much has changed since then. Um, but we are still telling the same stories that we did when we or how a lot of decades ago. <laughs> Any other reactions? I see Aoife is surprised. <laughs> so was I or so am I. And another question I want you to think about is um, why it's especially important for kids to have media messages that are um, healthy and uplifting um, and just not sexist. <laughs> kids specifically, like young people. All right, comments are still coming in, um, but yeah, so I'll tell you my answer. Um, kids especially need media literacy because they're still building their worldview. Um, yeah, like they internalize what they see for sure. Um, they're still figuring out their values. Um, and so if they're presented something like Snow White or Sleeping Beauty, or like the hundreds of other narratives that go along like this, where like the helpless girl is like supposedly helped by a guy who doesn't ask her for consent. Um, once you th once you see that so many times, um, you start to it, once you see that portrayed as like a good thing so many times, you start to think, oh, maybe that is a good thing. Um, yeah, Joy's saying kids are much more impressionable. That's also the word that I use. Um, so yeah, cool. So if there aren't more comments, or if there are more comments, I'll recognize them. Um, but we're gonna move on to another example, which is a lot more recent. <laughs> Hello, Ava Boyd. Um, Anyone recognize this? This is the music. This is a screenshot of the music video "Blurred Lines" by Robin Thicke. Um, eh, I don't like showing it, but yeah. Um, comment down below about like your reactions to this photo, how the women appear versus how the men appear. Jen says, "Ew." Yeah, I also agree. Um, the song is awful. Yeah. <laughs> It was so popular though, which like boggles my mind because it came out in 2013 and you'd be like, no, it's 2013. We're not going to like glorify predatory men. Oh, hello. Hello. Girls Project 20 gives it a minus minus. Um, but yeah, so what media message is being sent? 
and how do you feel about that? Um, this is terrible, yeah. You can see the women have, like, a sexualized posture, um, and they just kind of appear to be there to, like, please the men. Um, you can see the guy who's just, like, playing with the girl's hair. And then, with the lyrics, the, the man's voice says, I know you want it, literally 18 times, but there is no other voice that confirms that. And there, there's nothing that he, like, describes about the person that he's talking about um, that points to that. Um, and then, of course, there's the title of the song, Blurred Lines. So, like, what do we think blurred lines means? Like, consent or non-consent? I've seen some different interpretations, but they're all pretty... Not good. <laughs> All right, for the sake of time, I'm just gonna keep going in a little bit. Um, but yeah, like, so I interpreted blurred lines as it's not clear what the other person wants, but the the speaker wanted it to be a yes um which is not the way that consent is supposed to go we'll learn more about the specifics later um so yeah and i do have one more example um so i think i'll i'll show it briefly but for the sake of time there's a lot that i want to go to yeah the you know you want it song um, okay. So, yeah. Okay. And then, so quickly, I'll just go over this scene from Twilight. Hello, new person. Um, when, <laughs> it's another thing where, so in this scene, um, this is from Twilight. So Edward Cullen is watching Bella sleep. He breaks into her house to do this. Um, and this is framed as a, pro a as a protective gesture, but really it's stalkerish and creepy. Um, so that's just a third example. Um, and so on the whole, the I show you these messages to um, show you, I guess, like how... The media teaches us from a young age to think that, like, it's normal to have to convince a woman to do things, um, and, like, it's acceptable to violate her boundaries, um, and it, and the media does shape, um, like, real life culture, um, or people's views and beliefs in real life, um, and... Oh, I got some hearts. <laughs> and that just, it shows up in statistics about sexual assault. Um, so these are a little hard. They're really heavy topics, but um, I do want to include them. So the first is that every 73 seconds, an American is sexually assaulted. Um, and that among undergraduate college students, which many of you teen girls will be soon, 23.1% um, of females and 5.4% of males experience rape or sexual assault through physical force, violence, or incapacitation, um, which is crazy and unacceptable. Um, and I also want to point out that women of color suffer higher rates of sexual assault than white women, um, Native Americans the most, um, also disabled women, poor women, and immigrant women. So yeah, it's an unimaginable, it's an unimaginable amount of pain. Um, and although it's easy to turn away from it, um, to just if you want to hear a survivor's story, um, I really like... Um, ooh, dang it. I'm missing a slide. Okay. I really liked Chanel Miller's memoir, which is called Know My Name. 
Um, so I recommend that. And then, as a positive example of how sexual assault is portrayed in the media, hopefully I can find that slide. There it is. Oh, that's where that went. Okay. But yeah, so I don't know if anyone watches the show Sex Education, but it's on Netflix. I really like it. Um, and there's a scene where um, one of the characters, Amy, is on the bus and a man just kind of randomly masturbates on her leg and she dismisses it as silly. Like, she literally says, oh, I just got a bit of a shock. Um, but the thing is, like, her friend, like, has to spell it out for her that she was assaulted. Um, so I want to ask you the question, like, how does Amy's reaction reflect on, um, how does Amy's reaction reflect society's attitudes towards sexual assault? Um, I think what stands out to me is that she didn't even notice that it was assault and it is a problem. Um, but you can comment down below with your thoughts. Raylene says, it's a coping mechanism, one of many. Yeah, to just, like, dismiss what happened to you. And I think it's also, um, just because there's a lot of trauma from it. And I think, like, maybe you even subconsciously know that people may not take you seriously for it. Um... And yeah, like, what I do want to point out is that, um, downplaying assault, yeah. Um, in the bottom photo, you see Amy and her friends on the bus together, um, and that's just a nice scene where people come together, um, after, and we highlight the importance of, um, I guess giving support to each other, um, because it's a very real trauma. So yeah, um, the real world and the media is not so great. It's actually really bad <laughs> right now um, when it comes to sexual assault, as I'm sure a lot of you already know. Um, but what I think is important is imagining the world that we do want. So not taking um, the, like, knowing that we still have high expectations of others, or scratch that, <laughs> knowing that we won't accept the low expectations that society has set, especially for young men. Because um, I feel like nowadays, with the rates of sexual assault, it seems like... Um, it seems like if a guy asks for consent, that's almost like going above and beyond. But I think it's important to step back and remember that consent is a very basic thing. Consent is showing basic respect for a fellow human being. Um, and so I want to make sure that consent is framed as something that is a very like low bar. Like it's a requirement. Um, and so with that... I want to ask you, like, what you, how, how you define consent. So what is it and what is it not? Just to get your, your thoughts on this. Because I think it's really important to know um, what, well, <laughs> it's important to know what it is, but it's also really important to know it well and to know, like, what full consent is, what it looks like and what it doesn't look like. Um... So that you know, like, 
that you deserve to have all of these things um, offered to you and you are required to offer it to someone else when you're considering engaging in asexual activity. Consent is not a lack of a response. That's a really good point. Thank you. Oh, what do you like? Oh, that's a really, yeah, that's an awesome, um, that's an awesome example of, con of verbal consent. Enthusiastic, for sure, for sure. So yeah, um, I'm gonna read you a quote that I really like, makes me feel really nice inside. Um, if you want one word to define consent with, it's yes. Consent is a million is yes a million times over for the love of all things sparkly, awesome, and delicious, and not a minute longer. If you want to do it too, please, yes. That's a quote from Scarletine, which is a website I'll share with you later. Um, and then for a slightly more formal definition, I have this. So an active mutual process of willingly and freely deciding and negotiating sex of any kind with someone else. It's a lot of words, <laughs> but let's break it down. So, or we have more to say on this first. It's a shared responsibility for everyone who wants to engage in any kind of sexual interaction with someone. So not just women, not just young people, not just whoever didn't initiate sex to begin with, um, not just the person whose body part is going into someone else's body part, everyone. And it's not less important for partners who have the same sexual anatomy just because pregnancy isn't a risk. Um, also, nothing makes consent unnecessary or automatic. So yeah. You guys kind of nailed it, so we'll, we'll keep going. So another way that consent was taught to me in school or from Planned Parenthood was through the FRIES acronym. Oh, what does that say? Sex shouldn't happen to you no matter what your gender. Yes, that's a very good point, Jen. Um, I think being intentional and allowing your partner the space to be intentional with what they're doing is a really important part of any kind of intimacy. But yeah, so the FRIES acronym, I'll just go through it quickly since we're a little short on time, but there's different aspects of consent. Um, the first is that it should be freely given, so no pressure or manipulation, not when someone is drunk or high. Um, consent is reversible, so even if, um, so like at any point, anyone can change their mind about what they want to do. Enthusiastic. Um, Elizabeth mentioned that. And you should only do stuff, enthusiastic meaning that you should only do stuff that you genuinely want to do and specific. So saying yes to one thing doesn't mean that you're saying yes to something else. Any thoughts on the FRIES acronym? Awesome. So while I wait for the comments to come in, um, I want to give you a positive media example, a positive media example um, of where there was consent. So, Frozen. <laughs> this is the scene where Kristoff says, I could kiss you, but then he backtracks and says, I mean, I'd like to. May I? May we? Um, and then Anna says, we may, and then they kiss. Um, and so it's just a sweet, like, uplifting example of where there was consent. 
um, Kristoff asked, and it was clear that Anna's consent was freely given and enthusiastic, specific, and also reversible and informed. Yeah, <laughs> Jen says, ah. Hi, getting more hearts. Thank you. <laughs> Hello. Glad you're here. Um, so now I want to move into the legal stuff. Just one legal stuff. Has anyone heard of affirmative consent before? I think someone sh said something about this consent not being the lack of a response. Um, but yeah, so affirmative consent is a law that was passed in California um, in 2014, and it's like, its nickname is the Yes Means Yes law. That might jog some of your memories. Um, but yeah, so Yes Means Yes refers, or in the law, it means that it says that the lack of protest or resistance doesn't mean consent, nor does silence mean consent. So the accused not only, or the person accused of sexual assault um, doesn't just need to prove that the victim didn't say no, um, they need to prove that they did say yes. Oh, hi Alicia, don't worry, don't worry. Glad you're here. Um, so yeah, and so that raises a much higher standard um, for, let me get myself caught up raises a much higher standard for, um, the accused. Yeah, so, in the law defines affirmative consent, or, in the affirmative consent law, consent is defined as an affirmative, unambiguous, and conscious decision by which each participant by each participant to engage in a mutually agreed upon sexual activity, which is definitely a step up from just, they didn't say no. <laughs> cool. Um, leave me a comment. What are your thoughts about this affirmative consent thing? Ah, uh, thank you for the hearts. <laughs> All right, I'm going to move on, but I'll keep looking at the comments. Um, so now that we have, like, the theory, quote-unquote, behind consent down, I want to talk more about um, consent in practice. Because I feel like in our head, like, it kind of makes sense. Oh, we want the other person to feel comfortable. Oh, wait, when was this? This was in 2014. So... Um, I actually first read about it in Chanel Miller's book called Know My Name, um, because after her, after her assault, she was, like, that was the, the Brock Turner case, um, it caused a big public outcry, and, um, I'm not sure, like, if, if her, if Chanel Miller's case, like, directly led to the affirmative consent law, but they were related but yeah, um, so consent in practice. Um, Jen already mentioned an example of a word of a thing you could say um, to ask for consent, but like maybe you can give me some more, or maybe everyone can give me some more examples of words or nonverbals that you could use to either ask for consent in a good way or ask for consent in a way that doesn't pressure the other person or show that you're giving consent. I think the, gen the one that Jen said was, what do you like? Which is a very nice open-ended one. All right, um, so we're going to move on to um, a metaphor. 
to figure out, well, hmm. yeah, okay, I'm gonna tell you the metaphor. So the one that I like, that, that I've seen, that I really like about consent and practice um, is what I call the stoplight metaphor. So <laughs> you can navigate consent like navigating the streets. <laughs> Um, so as Scarlettine explains it, um, most of us understand that being in transit means that there's a possibility that you get hurt or you hurt others or that a good time turns into a bad time. Um, and so to try to, pre to try to prevent those outcomes, we need to follow basic rules of the road. Like, and this is the, this is the key part, being attentive to and actively giving clear signs and signals. Just like it's important on the road, it's important between the sheets. Yeah, so it's important to be responsive to what's happening. So I'll show you the, the one with the text. So there we go. Okay, you can kind of read it. So there's signs that you should stop, signs that you should pause and talk, and then signs that you can keep communicating. A couple things I want to point out about this. The one in the middle, the pause and talk one, isn't something that's shown in the media a lot, but it's really important because, well, you can kind of read the the descriptions, but for example, if you're not sure what the other person wants, you should definitely figure it out rather than assuming that you have consent or don't have consent. Um, the only way is, the only way to really know is to just ask. And the other thing I want to point out about this is the green. Um, so at no point is there a, a thing that says you don't have to keep asking for consent. Um, the green says to keep, con to keep communicating. So yeah, let me know if you have thoughts. And then, let's see. I'll give you some examples. Oh, dang it, it did cut off a little bit. Okay, some examples of what consent can sound like and some examples of what consent, of, of what non-consent can sound like. So you can just take a look at those. Um, I think someone said this earlier, but non-consent can sound like silence. Um, but on the other hand, consent can sound really exciting. <laughs> like there's the yippee and hot damn on the, on the left column. Cool. Um... So now I want to talk about something that I feel like is brought up a lot and which kind of like makes sense on the surface level. Um, but like something that's brought up a lot when people like talk about consent being something that you have to talk about when you're having sex with your partner. Um, as they say, like, what if talking ruins the moment? Um, and that's, like, that's a valid question. Um, but after, like, doing some research about this, I've seen that there's a lot of good answers. Um, there's a couple different ways to address this thought of what if talking ruins the moment. So the first one, which <laughs> is kind of like the tough, tough love one, which I really like, um, it doesn't matter if it ruins the moment. Consent is just show, like a, a matter of basic respect. Um, so if you want to have sex, then you should do the adult thing and ask to get full, full consent. Um, if you're not ready to talk about consent with your partner, then you're not ready to have sex. Um, so that's one. Another way to think about it is if it does ruin the moment, then that means that there was some doubt or like discomfort um, between 
the two of you to begin with. So maybe it's a good thing that the mood was, um, that the mood was, um, ruined. <laughs> What's that say? Not because I ruined the moment more. Yes. Thank you, Jed. I love that. Um, but yeah, because if both people were really excited, then, like, getting consent would definitely not ruin the moment. And that brings me to my next point. Consent is sexy. Um, I have a couple reasons here. So, one is challenge sexism and traditional gender roles. I don't know anything that's sexier than that. The second one is it's empowering. To verbalize, yes, to verbalize that, like, this is something that I want to do with you and to hear it back from them. And then the third is that in it, it enhances the communication and respect and honesty between um, people. So, like, it makes, I think it makes a relationship, like, stronger and more, like, emotionally intimate. Because um, sex is often seen as something that's just physically intimate, but I think it's, like, a whole experience. Hello, an American witch in London. <laughs> and yeah, and the more you talk about it with your partner, the less awkward it gets. So you can just get on that train already. If you want to, if you want to, I'm not encouraging anyone to have sex. Um, yes. And this is my favorite example of this thing. So um, in sex education, there's a scene where... Otis tries to finger Ola with her consent, but he doesn't really do it well. Um, and so, at some point, like, Ola invites Otis back, and then she asks him, she gives him consent, she says, I can show you what I like. Um, and that's a really nice scene, because it's like, it's still sexy, <laughs> um, but there's consent. You can see, like, with her head tilt, it's a little suggestive. Um, yeah, so we have a few more minutes, um, so there's just, I think, one, oh, there's a lot of things that I would like to tell you, but before I forget, I do want to say to follow Aoife's Instagram account. Let me find it. There it is. Aoife's been working really hard on it. Um, and I'm super excited to see what new content there will be. Um, okay. We can breeze through it a little bit. Um, so on accepting and respecting non-consent... Um, Like, yeah, no, I have my countdown. Okay, well, I think that it's important to recognize that, like, it can suck when you want something with someone else, but they don't also want it. Um, and so, like, I want to recognize that it's okay to have your feelings. Like, maybe you're a little sad or frustrated. Um, but what you can't do is express it in a way that puts pressure on your partner. Um, and you have to immediately stop if your partner gives you non-consent. So, I've got my two-minute countdown. Thank you! Yes, thank you for coming! Um, I do want to show you my resource list. You can find them there. Um, there's a lot more that you can explore. And I will also be here next Friday, so definitely tune in. I'll talk about the things that we didn't quite get to, um, and I hope you learned something. I'm going to stay until the time runs out in case there's a question that I can answer, or I can get more hearts. <laughs> Eva says I'm amazing. Thank you, Eva. You're amazing. Thank you. I hope you learned things. Thank you, Zena. <laughs> Oh, I got more hearts! <laughs> thank you, thank you. I hope you learned. Yes, you learned so much. Consent is sexy! <laughs> Alright. Over and out. <laughs>